Today we come to 2 Peter chapter 3. We finish up our study in 2 Peter beginning in verse 1. And Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 1. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. He says, I have written to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. In other words, think pure thoughts, think right thoughts. It's not smart to live in the land of make-believe, pretending that all is well when all is not well. But it's not right to always focus on the bad in the world either. And it's not, it's not right, it's not good to always just focus on the bad in our personal lives either. God says, think wholesome thoughts. In verse 2, he says, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through, our, through your apostles. And so what he is saying is, remember the word of God. Old Testament and New Testament. The words of the prophets, that's Old Testament. The words of your apostles, that's New Testament. Remember the word of God. When we pump ourselves full of God's word, our minds will be filled with wholesome thinking. And that will help us to avoid sin. And it will also keep us from dwelling on the bad all the time because there's a lot of positive stuff a lot of good, wholesome things in the Word of God for us to think about. Verse 3, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. The last days here refer to the time between the ascension of Jesus Christ and his return to earth. In other words, the last days refer to the entire church age. According to the prophet Joel, quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost, that was the beginning of the last days, the day of Pentecost, shortly after the ascension of Jesus Christ back into heaven. So the last days refers to the church age. We are in the last days today. And God warned, there will be scoffers in the last days. There will be scoffers in the church age. And there always have been. There have always been those who laugh at the scriptures. You tell them that it is the word of God. It contains truth. And many people will scoff at it. There have always been those who laugh at the thought of Jesus' return. The fact that he's said he's going to return to earth and judge everyone. There's always been scoffers and there continues to be today. And these people do not think that they are accountable to God's Son. They don't think they're accountable to God. And often their life reveals that. Verse 4, They will say, Where is this coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. In other words, these scoffers will say things like, Hey, nothing has changed since the world began. Well, that's a ridiculous statement, and he's going to deal with that in a few minutes, but the scoffers come along and say, hey, listen, God has never judged us in the past. Jesus is returning to earth to judge us? What are you talking about? Nothing has changed since the world began. God has never judged. So they're implying since nothing has changed according to them, since the world began, nothing can change. In other words, since Jesus has not returned yet, that means he never will. Well, what kind of ridiculous logic is that? There's no logic to that type of thinking. That's like saying, I've never broken a bone, therefore that proves I never will. Well, who in the world thinks like that? No one. No one thinks that way in any area of life until they get to Holy Scripture. Then they throw logic out the window. And I'll tell you why it happens. People who love their sin and aren't interested in pleasing God 
and don't want to think about the fact that they're going to have to stand before God, people who love their sin are willing to accept nonsense to feel good about continuing it, continuing in that sin. That's why they accept such flawed logic, because they'll accept anything that'll help justify their behavior. Four and five. They will say, where is this coming? He promised, ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Verse five. But they, they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. They say, hey, nothing has ever changed. Nothing has ever changed. Well, God reminds them that the starry heavens and the earth haven't been around forever. So that, that constituted a pretty big change at some point in history past. God created the heavens and the earth. That was a pretty big change. Just a little reminder, God made the heavens and the earth, which means that he is free to change them or destroy them anytime he wants to. And he says he will at some point. More on that a little later. Let's read five along with uh, six now. Kind of all flows together. Since, or excuse me, it says, but they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. The world of that time. So nothing ever changes? God never punishes? Well, what about the flood in Noah's day, God says? What about that? What, what about when I did that? And he says in verse 6, By these waters also the world of that time was deluged. The world of that time. You say, well, what time was it? When did that happen? Well, nobody knows the exact date. You can, by the way, use the dates found in the book of Genesis, the genealogies. And if you don't, um, if you don't allow for any gaps in the genealogy, you can figure out precisely when the flood of Noah occurred. Now, there may be gaps in those genealogies. Most people think that there were or there are. But if you just take the genealogies as they are, then 1,656 years after God created the world, he destroyed it with a worldwide flood because man had become utterly sinful. Whether it was 1,656 years or not doesn't really matter. That's not really the issue. The issue is this. The idea that God will not judge sin with the return of Jesus Christ because he has never judged the world for their sin in the past simply is not true. That's revisionist history if I've ever heard any. Verse 7. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. The day when God will judge the living and the dead and destroy everything with fire is set. That day is set. What well, says here in verse 7, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are, are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment. That day is set. It is circled on God's calendar. It's not known except to God, but it is set. And so maybe the world doesn't seem to change. And maybe the scoffers say everything stays the same. But God has judged the world because of their sin. And God has punished sinners in the past. And he will in the future as well. Verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. In other words, there's no passage of time with God like there is with us. Don't take this literally. A day is like a thousand years to God, or a thousand years is like a day to God. Don't take that literally. 
don't figure that there's a ratio here. For every one of our days, it's like a thousand years to God. Or every one of God's days is like a thousand years to us. Don't take it that way. That's not what is intended here. What it simply is saying is this. There's no passage of time with God like there is with us. God is everywhere at the same time. And every second of time in eternity is the now to God. Isn't that incredible? Every second of time in eternity is the now to God. So, if someone says, if someone says, if God's going to judge, what is he waiting for? If somebody says that, I can answer that question. The answer is, he's not waiting. He's not waiting for anything. We are, perhaps, but he isn't. He's already in judgment day. He is in every second of time and eternity. It's all the now to him. Verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. A lot of people figure that if Christ is going to return, then he should have done it by now. But Jesus is willing to be patient. He's giving sinners more time to repent and more time to receive him. There's not a human being who has or ever will live that God does not want to save. He doesn't want anyone to burn in hell. He wants to take everybody to heaven with him. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for everyone's sin, whether they believe it or not. 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. And so Jesus is waiting. Jesus is patient. But he will not wait forever. He will return. And he will judge. He will return and he will judge people. And then Christ will set off an explosion that will destroy everything he created in those first six days. The earth and everything in it. The earth and everything in outer space will explode into nothingness on the last day. 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. Well, you talk about logic. That makes sense. You ought to live holy and godly lives? Yeah, I think so. Since God's going to punish everyone who refuses to obey him and everyone who refuses to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and receive his mercy and his forgiveness, it only makes sense to get serious about God, I would say. doesn't take a genius to figure that one out, does it? Those who live for the things of this world while ignoring their duty to God are investing their time and energy in a lost cause. 11 and 12. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. The elements will melt in the heat? There's a lot of people who think that this describes a nuclear explosion. That the Bible teaches, of course, that in the book of Colossians, that Jesus actually is the one who is holding the atoms together. He's the one, he is the force that keeps the atoms from splitting. It is Christ who holds all things together. And it would be a very simple thing for him just to release his grip on this universe, on the atoms, and the whole works would go up in, a, in an atomic explosion. And that seems to be what is described here. At any rate, look at verse 12 again because it says, As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. He says, as you look forward to the day of God, the day of God, 
God has given man many days. God has given man many days to enjoy on earth, many days to repent, many days to find mercy. Man has had many days, but God is said to have one day. It is the day of God. It is the day of judgment. God's day is the day Jesus cleans up the mess that sin has made of his creation. God's day is the day he says, enough. Those of you who would not accept my mercy will now experience my wrath. That's what's going to happen on the day of God. 13. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. And so after God's judgment, there will be good times for his people. God will make a new earth for us to live on and a new starry heavens for us to look at and probably explore. And won't that be nice? And everything will be good. It will be a fresh and clean, righteous and happy earth. And that will never change. There will be no more judgment after that. Everything will be set in place and everything will be wonderful for those who belong to Christ. 14. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. In other words, while we wait to see Jesus Christ, we should try hard not to sin. And there are some Christians who believe that it really doesn't matter how we live as Christians. It doesn't really matter. After all, we're forgiven in Christ. We're saved by God's grace. It doesn't really matter. It does matter. It matters to God. God is pleased when we live right. That's the most important reason to live right. He commands us, be holy for I am holy. That's a very important reason to live right. It does matter. Not only that, we won't have a guilty conscience when we live the right way. And we won't have all the bad that goes along with sinning. And we won't have all the temporary unpleasant consequences that go along with sinning and we won't have all the bad that goes along with dealing with a guilty conscience if we live the right way either. See, so there are a lot of good reasons for God to say in verse 14, so then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. And by the way, we're going to stand before him and be judged according to our work. So that's another pretty good reason, I would say, to live for him. 15. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. And where would we be if it wasn't for God's patience? Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. In other words, remember why Jesus is waiting. Remember why Jesus is patient. Why is he patient? Why is he waiting? It's to give us more time to tell others about Jesus. It's to give lost, hell-bound sinners more time to repent. Listen, if God was not patient, this world would have been long gone. And none of us would escape the flames of hell if it wasn't for God's patience. 16. He writes the same way in all his letters. Speaking in them of these matters, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. In verse 16, Peter just told us that the letters the Apostle Paul wrote are inspired Holy Scripture, just like the Old Testament. And he says Paul's letters, you know, his letters that are a part of Scripture, they're hard to understand sometimes and therefore easy to twist and misapply by those who do not study as they should. And so we see from this that right from the very start, there have been false teachers who twist the Scriptures and lead people astray as a result. That's nothing new. 17. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position. It is possible for Christians to fall 
from their secure positions. And notice something else he says here in verse 17. Since you already know this, since there are false teachers out there. You know, it's not a question of if false teachers will come your way. The question is when. And they come in all shapes and sizes too, by the way. And they usually offer something that appeals to a person's desire to please God. A false teacher will not offer you something horrendous, something spiritually ugly. I mean, they're not going to deceive anybody with that. They will offer you something that appeals to your desire to please God, your, your desire to do something good. That's what they will use, but it's only bait. By luring people with something good, they trick them into accepting bad. That's, that's the classic tactic of false teachers and cults. So what's the antidote? How do we avoid this? How do we avoid the traps? 18, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. The solution to the problem of false teachers? Hey, this isn't going to get rid of them. But the solution to the problem of false teachers is to know the word of God and to know the Savior. Then, when someone comes along teaching lies, the Holy Spirit will be able to let you know that it's not right. You'll recognize it. Next time, 1 John. Until then, so long, everyone.